public defense for some form of procedure. Um, I'd also like to introduce myself. My name is Antonia Jeder. I'm the chair of this dissertation committee, and I'd like to introduce the other committee members, Dr. Timothy Anderson, Dr. Charles Weber, Dr. Troll Dine, and Dr. Sully Taylor, who's also the graduate um, representative. Um, so in the next 40 minutes or so, you will be presenting on your results. Thank you very much, Dr. Jenner, for a very nice introduction, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking the time in the morning to come to my dissertation defense. First of all, I'd like to thank my committee who helped me along the way until we got this uh, wonderful result that I'm about to explain and discuss with you. So my dissertation topic is the impact of social capital on innovation intermediaries. First of all, you may wonder, what is innovation intermediaries? So I have an example. They come in different sizes, shapes, form, in different sectors around the world. For example, we have in industry the Gomong Management Consulting Firm, like McKinsey and Company, whose estimated revenue is $7 billion in 2010, in uh, university, there are more than 230 U.S. university <coughs> who has technology management, uh, managing the technology licensing of more than 38,000 licenses, which worth billions of dollars. And in the government, in, U in the U.S., we have Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program a part of National Institute of Standard and Technology who work with more than 1,300 technical experts generating more than 2.5 billion additional in sales revenue. Of all these different size, shape, and forms of innovation intermediaries, one thing is intriguing. There are a large economic impact, but the process is poorly understood some doing a good job, some not so good. It's difficult to manage. This is the inspiration for this research. So my talk, uh, my dissertation defense today will start with the research idea, identify research gap, objective, and research question. Then I will talk a, a little bit about the theoretical background that will lead us to research model and research hypothesis and the methodology that I use, which is questionnaire surveys and multivariate statistical analysis to prove the hypothesis, report on the result, discussion, and some future work. So let's start with the research idea. As mentioned earlier, we have practical problems. Technical knowledge has been dispersed from around the world. Maybe the knowledge from US university can be used in the company in Japan, in China, Innovation intermediary is a middleman who acts as a person who transfers this knowledge from one end, which is company who has a problem, so we call them solution seekers. And the other end is the expert around the world who want to find a solution, so uh, want to give the solution to them, so we call them problem solvers. This practical problem, as stated earlier, the process is poorly understood and make it difficult to manage. Why is poorly understood? We take a look at the theoretical problem statement. Uh, there are many different streams of research trying to make sense of innovation intermediaries. First, the uh, productivity dilemma by Abernathy stated that in the successful you know, intermission intermediary process, the result can be either efficient gain or innovativeness improvement, but not both at the same time. Then, in the technical problem-solving literature, successful intermediation process depends on how the problem solver frame the problem, and differently framed problem will result in different outcomes. And we have different resources available to us the different resources will lead to different problem framing. Social capital is one of the resources that innovation intermediary can use. We can see from here that there are innovation
information interview process, social capital, problem framing, intermediary process. Of all these research streams, there is no relationship or no one research to try to find the relationship before. So this dissertation will try to identify the relationship of these different streams of research. From these, we identify four research gaps. There is a lack of understanding in innovation intermediaries. There's a lack of study in the relationship between these three particular research streams, which is intermission intermediaries, problem solving, and social capital. There's also a practical need for the innovation intermediary organization, as well as the practical needs of the customers of the innovation intermediary organization. From this gap, we identify two research objectives. The first objective is to identify relationship between these three research streams, social capital, problem framing, and outcome of the innovation intermediate process. Also, the second objective is to propose a strategy for the intermediary organization and their stakeholders to achieve their desired outcome. This leads us to four research questions. The first two is, what is the relationship between social capital and problem framing? The second question, what is the relationship between problem framing and the outcome of intervention intermediate process? And also, what aspect of social capital, if any, that improve the intervention intermediate process? And how to promote this aspect? And what aspects of social capital, if any, that inhibit the process? And how to eliminate or reduce such aspects? From the research gap objective and research question, I'd like to discuss a little bit about the theoretical background that we build up to our research model. As mentioned earlier, innovation intermediary process, on one end, we have solution seeker the company that has the problems and want to find a solution. On the other end, we have problem solver and experts around the world, maybe from the university, from government lab, from company lab. And we have innovation intermediaries who try to connect them together. First, innovation intermediary has to understand the problems, know how to frame it properly. Then they may be able to find the right solver by use their social capital, try to find the right expert for the right uh, so solution seekers. Then they match this together from the process of innovation intermediary. But how to frame the problem properly? Uh, the literature in technical problem solving, spearheaded here by um, Schrader, Ritz, and Smith, propose that the problem solver has a choice to choose to frame the problem either ambiguity or uncertainty reduction. And please note that this proposition has been cited thousands of times in the uh, literature, but no one has ever shown the hypothesis testing on this proposition, not that we have found if the problem has been framed as ambiguity or ambiguous, it means that the problem solver think that they don't know what they don't know. It's like an unknown unknown. So the solutions may likely lead to what that call, we call innovation or annuity because it may cause some change or some differences in the solution. Why, on the other hand, if the problem has been framed as uncertainty and we want to try to reduce the uncertainty, the problem may be the solution solver already know kinds of variable that they have to work on, but they don't know the optimal solution. So they try to find optimal solution. This may lead to efficiency. And this proposition by Schrader, Rick, and Smith can be summarized in this chart. We have problem framing on one end with uncertainty reduction or ambiguity reduction, which is a choice of the problem solver. Uncertainty reduction leads to efficiency improvement, 
why ambiguity reduction lead to innovativeness improvement. This is the proposition that Trader Rick and Smith has been proposed. And for social capital, many people may ask, so what actually is social capital? So in general sense, I may say, I know my friend in Thailand, I know my colleague in Singapore, I can call, I can email, or I can go and ask them, can you help me? I have this question, can you give me the idea? Can you even solve the problem for me? These kinds of relationship from other people is what we call social capital. In, this, in my case, I use the definition divided by Nahpiet and Gazo. The definition of social capital, that is our working definition, is the sum of resources embedded within, available through, and derived from the network of relationships possessed by an individual or organization. Please note that it's a sum of resources. It's a network of relationships, so you need it uh, to, for your benefit. And in the literature, there are two aspects of social capital that has been discussed. The first is bonding social capital. We need to trust and understand people in the similar group in order to gain their knowledge. And these kinds of bonding social capital has been discussed in the literature as network closures. On the other side, in, uh, on the other hand, there's uh, another aspect called Bridging social capital, which is the relationship that you want to bridge to different groups of people. And this, uh, in the literature, is called bridging the structural holes. And for bonding, because it's bonding within the people that you are familiar with, it's highly likely that the result of the problem solution will come up with this idea that you have already had before but it's improvement of it. So it might be the efficiency improvement that related to bonding social capital. Why for bridging social capital, you try to find answers from different group, different people who have different ideas from you. So they may come up with some out of the box idea and give you some innovation. That's why we can say that for problem framing, according to Trader, Rick and Smith, ambiguity has some relationship with innovation, Why uncertainty has relationship with efficiency. And for social capital literatures, bridging the structural holes may lead to innovation, while bonding deep relationship may have a relationship with the efficiency. From these literatures, building block, that leads us to what we have, research model. The model here, you may notice, this is Trader Rick and Smith, problem solving and the outcome. And because the information intermediary has social capital as their resources, they can use boarding or bridging that may have a relationship with uncertainty, efficiency, ambiguity, and innovativeness. That's why in our dissertation, in our research, we can link outcome of the process, problem framing and social capital through this research model. And from this model, I come up with six research hypotheses that divided into three pairs. The first pairs of the hypothesis has to do with social capital and overall process until the outcome. Hypothesis one states that social capital of innovation intermediary agents is associated with successful project with efficiency improvement. Hypothesis 2 states that social capital of innovation intermediary agents is associated with successful project with innovativeness improvement. The second pairs of the hypothesis, hypothesis 3 and 4, is the hypothesis that has to do with the first link that we saw in the model. Hypothesis trust state that innovation intermediary agent with strong rich bonding social capital tend to choose uncertainty reduction more frequently than the agent with lower bonding social capital do. Hypothesis four state that innovation intermediary agent with strong bridging social capital tend to choose ambiguity reduction 
more frequently than the agent with lower breathing social capital. And last pairs of the hypothesis has to do with the last part of the model. Problem hypothesis five states that problem framing with focus on uncertainty reduction is associated with solutions that result in efficiency improvement. And hypothesis six states that problem framing with focus on ambiguity reduction is associated with innovative solutions. So in summary, we can see that we match our model with the hypothesis that we have, hypothesis one and two for the overall process, social capital for innovation in term theory outcome. Hypothesis three and four between bonding and uncertainty, bridging and ambiguity, and hypothesis five and six between uncertainty as efficiency and ambiguity as innovativeness. So how am I going to come up with the result from this research model? I'd like to discuss about the research methodology that I have used. In this research, I use statistical hypothesis testing to test the hypothesis from the data collected from the questionnaire survey of the innovation intermediary agent. And the unit of study in this case is the intermediary agents called ITA, or Industrial Technology Advisors, from the innovation intermediary organization called ITAP in Thailand. Please note that this is for population survey, so it is generalizable for any innovation intermediary organization. You may wonder what actually is ITAP. ITAP stands for Industrial Technology Assistance Program. This program tries to stimulate economic growth of Thailand through the use of technology. And how they do that? They do that by provide technical and business advisory services and financial assistance to the small, medium-sized enterprise via the help of the intermediary agent called ITA. So basically, this is prototypical innovation intermediary. The SME come with the question, how can I improve my process? Ask the ITA. ITA go and find expert maybe in university, in national lab, and give them the answer. And as I mentioned earlier, I use questionnaire survey, but in this case, I gather the data by face-to-face -face interview. Uh, we have 50 ITA working currently in ITAP. I call each and every one of them and make an appointment and sit down one by one, and I get hold of them 46 ITA in the period of two months. That's translated into 92% response rate. And of course, when we discuss face-to-face -face and ask them the question and fill in the answers in the questionnaire, we cannot force the respondent to answer any question that they don't feel comfortable with. And one ITA refused to complete part of the surveys, rendering the result to have full usable data of 45 or 90% of the population, which is still perfectly usable in this case. And this is the variable that I use for the hypothesis testing. I categorize this into four categories. The first two categories is social capital. The first one has to do with the quality of the relationship. This, according to the literature, the social capital has been divided into three dimensions. Structural dimensions represented by ease of bridge. Relational dimension represented by trust. And cognitive dimension represented by mutual understanding. The second set of variables has to be social capital, so network of natures of the network. This has to do with the bridging and bonding. There are two uh, categories in this category. First, the similarity or difference in affiliation represented by organization homogeneity and organization heterogeneity variable. The second set is similarity.
similarity and differences in expertise or knowledge domain that the expert has. This represents by knowledge homogeneity and knowledge heterogeneity. For problem framing, I use uncertainty tolerance and ambiguity tolerance as the proxies for the ambiguity and uncertainty. And lastly, for the outcome of innovation intermediate process, I use annual average of successful project with efficiency improvement and annual average of successful project with innovativeness improvement of the agent as the variable. And the measurement from for this variable come from first what the literature call egocentric network survey, or in general term, it's generally the name generator. I asked so, uh, the innovation intermediate agent to generate the names of the people that they have been working with. And this is for social capital variable. The second set is subjective grading with five level liquor scale for the problem framing variable. And I use archival record of the project to review the outcome of the project as a variable. Please note that these measurements are taken and adapted from the appropriate literature. We haven't reinvented the wheel. It has been literature. We just used it and adapted it in our case. And this is an example of ecocentric network survey. I asked the ITA or the intermediary agent to name the people that they have, the expert that they have been worked with within the past years. They give me the name. Give me the affiliation maybe from the university, from the lab, and then they have a choice to choose is this expert is has the similar expertise with them, similar knowledge, somewhat similar or different knowledge. And then they give the score of one to ten pertaining the quality of the relationship that they have or they think they have for ease of reach, trust and mutual understanding. As for the uncertainty <coughs> and ambiguity tolerance, I adapted the questionnaire from literature from Fordham. This is a series of questions pertaining the decision or choice of the agent making the proper framing. And this variable calculate as the average value of the rating score. And this is an example of the rating score question so I asked the agent, do they agree, disagree, in what degree for this overall <coughs> statement? And then we combine and average the score for uncertainty and ambiguity and get the representation of the variable. With all of these numbers, variable, and measurement, then I want to recap that. We want to analyze and see if the hypothesis is true or not by saying that first social capital and outcome which is hypothesis one and two social capital and problem framing hypothesis three and four and social capital and problem framing and outcome hypothesis five and six i perform multivariate statistical analysis particularly using regression analysis with simple linear regression for all independent variables. For the case of hypothesis one, two, three, and four, we have seven social capital variables. And then for problem framing variable with related to hypothesis five and six, we have another two variable. Uh, this result into 30 simple linear regression model. And then I also perform multiple linear regression with stepwise estimation to try to pick up the variable that has the uh, strong relationship, especially in the case of H1, H2, HT, and H4. This is another additional four model. So of all of these analysis and the regression model, you may wonder what actually is the result. So. Um, after running all these analysis and assess the data, I found that three out of six hypotheses has been confirmed or accepted at various degree of confidence level, particularly hypothesis one and two. 
are both accepted at 95% confident level and 99% confident level. Hypothesis 4 is accepted at 95% confident level, while hypothesis 3, 5, and 6 fail to accept it. So from this, we may want to dive down what actually in the social capital variable that has the effect or has a relationship with each of our dependent variable. So I'd like to tell you the detail of the social capital as the independent variable and dependent variable for hypothesis 1, 2, 3, 4 that has the uh, confidence level differently according to the regression model. First, for efficiency improvement, we found that ease of reach has positive relationship, while mutual understanding has negative relationship. We couldn't find any other independent variable has the statistically significant relationship with efficiency improvement. As for hypothesis two, that has to do with innovativeness outcome. The result show that ease of reach also has positive relationship with innovation. Trust has negative relationship. Organization homogeneity has negative relationship and knowledge homogeneity has positive relationship. Please note that knowledge homogeneity with positive relationship is unexpected. It's likely caused by the interaction effect, which I will discuss later on. And for hypothesis three, we couldn't confirm this hypothesis, so no particular uh, independent variable perform and show statistical significance with uncertainty tolerance. Lastly, for ambiguity tolerance, ease of bridge also has positive relationship with ambiguity tolerance. Trust has this time positive relationship at lower confidence level than 95%, it's 90%. Mutual understanding has negative relationship and organization heterogeneity has positive relationship. From this uh, detailed variable of social capital, if you recall earlier, I have mentioned that we have social capital variable in two aspects, bridging and bonding. And this set of variable is related, are related to bridging and bonding in particular way. For bridging social capital, the ease of bridge, organization and knowledge, heterogeneity is the one that explains bridging social capital. And we can see from here that all of these variables has positive relationship with our dependent outcome variable. As for bonding social capital, trust, mutual <coughs> understanding, organization homogeneity, and knowledge homogeneity, we can see in here that they have both positive and negative relationship. So what to make sense of all these positive, negative relationship? That leads us to the discussion part. We can see as expected that bridging structural goal bridging social capital has positive relationship with problem framing and the outcome. Why bonding social capital has both positive and negative relationship? So there are two sides of bonding. Of course, as expected, some bonding, as we, in general sense, we say trust is needed. You have to trust someone first in order to reach out and ask them for the information. But too much Trust might backfire, might, might be negative to your outcome. Why? We identify this in the literature as group things, mental state of sticking together while people have mutual understanding or trust each other so hardly, so, so much, they bond and they think, okay, we are in the same group, I trust you. This may limit the expert from outside to break into the group, and you may not get the good information if you stick with the group things. And also, 
too much trust and mutual understanding is associated in the literature that called not invented here syndrome or the effect of the people who stick together and reject idea from outsider thinking that our idea is the best or our idea is good enough we don't have to change in fact from outsider people may be able to contribute a better or a good idea to you so there are two sides of warning and also we noticed in our result earlier on that bridging and bonding has to be together in order to be effective bridging especially is a bridge is the mechanism that you go out and connect ask people or actually make the contact of the expert why bonding for example trust is the supportive and underlying underlying mechanism to make you consider to ask the expert in the first place and this bridging and bonding come together is associated with what the researchers in one side call the synergistic view of social capital so we confirm this synergistic view rather than the other side that asks for or the older view that call for binary view either you have to have bonding or you have to have bridging we argue you have to have both and it's synergized together and this synergistic view also agree with the organizational literature that's called organization ambidexterity in a short on organization ambidexterity stated that the organization will be successful if they are able to use the external knowledge explore the external knowledge and then also exploit their internal capability and they have to have both and with bridging with bridging you can explore external knowledge and with bonding you can exploit internal so both of them so that leads us to my summary of the research i show that there are both positive and negative relationship between social capital and problem framing. I also show that there's both positive and negative relationship between social capital and the outcome. Unfortunately, hypothesis five and six both fail to accept, so I could not say for certain with statistical confi confidence that there's a relationship with problem framing and outcome, but since there's a relationship between social capital to the whole process we can infer that there might be some relationship but that wouldn't stop me we may have to investigate further what about that two particular hypothesis that's not shown in our uh, data so there are three possible view maybe there's a link but our data cannot capture it or there is more complex link than what Schrader, Rick, and Smith has been proposed, and this proposition has never been proved before. Or actually, there is no such a link. So I dive down into my data once more and try to see, okay, if there is a link, is there any kinds of link that we can explain with our hypothesis testing? In fact, we can. I arrange the data from the outcome by using the numbers of the outcome and rank it from the people who has the most outcome with innovation from top to bottom and then we pick out we say these people who has a lot of innovative outcome we call them the group called top innovators on the other hand we rank again people with a lot of efficiency outcome and then rank from higher to lowest we call them top efficiency improver from this group of people we can see that top innovator has the average ambiguity tolerance score higher than uncertainty why the top efficiency improver has the average uncertainty tolerance score higher than 
So in this sense, we can say from descriptive statistics, there's some link going on between innovation, ambiguity, efficiency, and uncertainty. But we cannot say for sure with statistical confidence that there is a link according to the hypothesis. So in this case, I recommend the improvement in the problem framing measurement, which should be the focus on the future research. What about the other case, if there is some more complex links? So I searched the literature and find that even though Schroeder and Smith has proposed some form of relationship between uncertainty and ambiguity, there are some additional or different kinds of work has been done in this area as well. That ambiguity and uncertainty may occur at the same time to different or varying degree. So our assumption for Schroeder and Smith might be true. So there are different theoretical frameworks that play, that come at play in these stages, and this should be the focus on future research in order to decide the hypothesis to match this additional framework. And of course, the work itself has some limitation, as mentioned earlier. There are some expected outcome, and these call for the improvement of the knowledge homogeneity and knowledge heterogeneity measurement itself. And also in my case, I measure the individual social capital. In future, the pe people can also use collective as a team, as a group, as a department, or as the organization as a whole, as the measure for the social capital and try to see different hypotheses. In this dissertation, I use static position of social capital. In the future, people can use dynamic <coughs> stages of social capital from the forming of social capital. Because, of course, when you first contact people, you have never known them before. It's zero social capital. You build trust, you have more social capital. You abandon some, some link that you have been known for 10 years. Social capital may be less. So this dynamic of increasing, decreasing of social capital can be studied in future research. And last but not least, this study focus on intermediary agent only. In the future, you can try to map the whole supply chain of social capital process from the agent in one, in, in one side, from the solution seeker or the company in one side, and the problem solver or the expert from the other side, and map their social capital network to give the whole pictures of the process. And that could be done in the future. But even that with the limitation, we can conclude in our study and give the implication for the organization and the stakeholder. In order to achieve efficiency and innovation, of course, the organization should provide and enhance the way for communication with the expert. In the sense, give, give them more ease of reach because ease of reach has positive relationship with everything we want. Why do not overemphasize on trust and mutual understanding? Trust has both positive and negative relationship. Of course, you need some trust, but not overemphasizing it because it may backfire and cause group things and not invented here. And especially for innovation, you might want to in encourage the boundary spending activity to get to know people outside of your organization. So in conclusion, this dissertation has theoretical contribution. By showing the function of social capital in the innovation intermediate process, and also provide the first empirical investigation of the technical problem solving and social capital, especially for Schrader, Rick, and Smith, and showing that we need more or extended the theory. And also from te theoretical contribution, we have practical contribution to show the target for managing individual social capital to achieve organizational objective. 
And that is the end of my dissertation presentation. Uh, I'd like to inform that part of this research from the literature review, thanks to my advisor, Dr. Jader, who asked me to send the review for competing in the award at the Autumn Foundation, and I got the runner-up prize. And also, the preliminary result of this research has been submitted and accepted to be presented in PIGMET 2013. So if you happen to go to San Jose and be in the PIGMET conference, uh, you can listen to the presentation again. And also, we have uh, already uh, have the paper ready for the review for submission for IND management. And with that, uh, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would like to open this for questions from the committee. So the committee goes first, and at a later stage, the audience can also ask questions. Um, and I think it makes sense to just go um, step by step. So one question is, Dr. Anderson, do you want to start? OK. Um, so in here, uh, a lot of uh, the work is fundamentally based on the idea that the ICAP agent is able to take the problem and steer it in a direction towards being more innovative versus more of an efficiency improvement yes. uh, based on their own skills, their own framing, and other uh, elements of their own makeup. How much of an effect does the inherent nature of the kind of problems that they're given, either based on their supervisor? assignment or based on the kind of problem domain that they work in, how might that potentially also affect these results? Uh, the ITAP agent themselves has the what we call the groups that they work with. And of course, the groups has the managers who think that, okay, this guy is a computer expert. So the computer program or the problem with the computer may go to this person. This person is expert in agriculture. Maybe we can give the problem to this person for the agriculture. So in the sense, the topic of the problems may be framed or given to the agent. But the nature of the agent themselves, the resource that they have, the relationship with the people that they have, still play significantly in their uh, problem framing in order to get the outcome that they need to achieve. Okay. And uh, I was really impressed that your work ended up um, taking a, a turn a, a few weeks ago where you realized uh, that you could improve upon the analysis and results and re-ran every, uh, virtually everything. It was very similar to one of our past graduates, Dr. Karen Eden, who realized she had run everything using multiple regression and it should be multiple logistic regression. And she ran off, re ran all of her results after the committee had already thought the results were good yes. and had replaced them and they were stronger. Can you comment on, on that a little bit and maybe how your tool selection of R and SPSS enabled you to do that well? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. Thank you for the question. And in fact, I have to thank all the committee members because we have pre-defenses meeting last two weeks, and during the meeting I have showed the result, and the committee have asked the question, and raised one question that uh, the outcome may be, be improved by using a different sense of outcome. And in fact, I have that set of outcome. So given that, um, with the comment, we've got, so I go back and run uh, for this statistical analysis, I can show you. I have used um, this program, SPSS and R. So the result is basically the same. So from the, for example, we have this uh, outcome variable, variable 10 and 11, which is, has to be changed. So I have used the, SPNS, I run the script to make sure that every everything is repeatable. So once I have all the variable, I put the script, run it. But because SPSS, of course, we are human, we input 
data we use in the computer might be wrong. I go about and use R, which is open source software um, inspired by Dr. Anderson and his class that use R as well. So I go on and take a look at R and okay, I can use R to imitate that result as well. So I wrote the R script from scratch for every hypothesis that I have and rerun it again by inputting the data from what I have the first time. So with this case, we eliminate what we call human error because I input the data first time, it has answered. Input data second time with different program, different code, the result is the same. So um, that give me the confidence that this is actually the result. And with that, tools also, when the committee asked me, could you change the variable that you have this variable 10 and 11, change the number, I go on and input the new number, rerun it by a click of a button because I already wrote the script and compare these two programs together, the result confirmed. So um, thank you very much for the question and that's, that's a very good I mean, exercise for me to see that the model as is what right. essentially that ran 40 different analyses yes. again or so and was able to move very very quickly overnight so great job and then uh, one question in here as long as it's up I, I see that the coefficient of variation um, yes. is very small for variables five and six in particular and maybe even seven yes. telling me that almost everybody that scores their their colleagues on reach trust and mutual understanding as seven eight nine ten I mean, there's almost nothing below a seven, probably, I expect. There is some, but most, mostly they are. Um, and my comment on trust, mutual understanding, and ease of reach is that because we use the ecocentric network survey, it's the survey that gives the perception of ITA themselves. So, of course, you have to have, you think that you, the expert is easy to reach. The expert is trustable and they are kind of understand the expert. Otherwise, they will not be the expert for this for them in the first place. The, the thing here is that we can capture the different, even though a little with the small standard deviation, the differences still show that different kind or different level of ease of reach task in mutual understanding has the effect on the outcome. has been raised before. In fact, uh, and I have to thank Dr. Anderson for the pointer. If we have the population, for example, I, I like to use that example and it's easy to understand. For example, we have US election, population of the US 300 million people. You cannot go and ask every one of them who are you going to select as your president. But if you can ask almost all of them, 95%, 90% of 300 million, it's like 200 something million people. So even with that, you can say for confident, even the confident level is so low that this answer is the representation. So in our case, scale it down. We have 50 people. In fact, I can just report that out of these 50 people, how they work. They connect to the expert. They prefer to connect to this expert. This expert has ease of reach. I can just have the average score and say, okay, this is the average score. They have the relationship or not have the relationship. But I selected to restrict myself much more by using statistical analysis. Because with that sense, we can generalize the, data, the answer. And we restrict ourselves, meaning that if we relax, relax that, it will be much more confident. And I can show you with the numbers. Uh, 
In fact, we have what it's called in the statistical uh, way, finite population correction factor. This helps to increase the significant level of the finite population. So without FPCF, which in my case, the result is more restrictive. And as restrictive, we already see the confidence level and the acceptance of all these hypotheses. For example, the calculation is that you use population size minus the sample size divided by population size minus one and take the square root. And this factor in our case is 0 0.3194. But how to use it? So I'll pick up one case for you to see. The case is the hypothesis that is not confirmed, which is hypothesis five, we say uncertainty and efficiency. So people who are not who are not familiar with SPSS might not understand. I will talk you to by step by step. First, you want to see the model with a good R square. This one is not quite good. It's zero point two nine two percent of the the efficiency has been explained by uncertainty. That's why the thing is here the significant level of the model itself is not good. It's zero. The p-value is 0 0.267, so high. So you rejected it at 95% uh, confidence level. Uh, and you can see from the coefficient, this is positive coefficient, significant value is high. With population correction factor, we multiply this by 0 0.3194, meaning that you can be and say that this model is accepted because now the p-value is 0 0.085. It's accepted that at p-value less than 0 0.1 or confidence level of 90%. So in my case, I restrict myself with the small population. But with population correction factor, maybe, and this proof that yes, maybe there's some relationship between uncertainty and efficiency. But I cannot say with 95% confidence level. Can I follow up on this one just for clarification? Um, so why did you choose to restrict yourself? If you're saying statistics books tell you, state of the art tells you, you could have used this, this uh, population correction factor and then your results would have been even more accepted. Yes, but that would not give us a value because this, this uh, measurement is some kind of subjective measurement. We ask people for opinion. We ask people to there is a bridge trust. It's not the sub objective measurement of numbers, but this number is the representation of subjective judgment. So we don't want to say that this is for sure the research didn't happen. That's why we restrict ourselves. And if even if we restrict ourselves and we can stay for sure, then we may be say with confidence that this relationship actually happened. Okay, uh, you were well prepared for this one, so I'm going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay to keep my reputation at stake. So, why don't you go to the slide with these two curves, Schroeder and oh, Smith? Yes. Um, okay. Um, Somehow this gets to, well, first of all, Schroeder, Riggs, and Smith seem to have proposed either or, where this was like a matrix, right? Now, yes. this diagram mm -hmm. confers that you sort of have to peel an onion. You got to get ambiguity, you got to get rid of ambiguity first before you can deal with uncertainty, okay? That's number one. Um, number, uh, number two is, um, I, I even wrote this down. Um, you're solving problems, okay? So how does ambiguity, how do ambiguity and uncertainty relate to problem solving? Are there problems with different structure or, or these kinds of things? Because I think you're onto something and I can't quite put my finger on it. Okay, okay thank you, Dr. Weber. Even that, I have prepared. <laughs> because this, uh, because Trader, Rick, and Smith, as mentioned earlier, has proposed 
But it's amazed to us, even me, and I discussed with Dr. Jader since I started with this dissertation. How come? Why nobody has proven this Frederick and Smith? In fact, there are some people proven it, but they cannot prove with statistical hypothesis. And this is one of the people who try to prove or say that, well, Frederick and Smith, that has problem framing as ambiguity and uncertainty might be true, but not 100%. That's why they add, that I, why I say this is different theoretical framework, and this is from Charlton, Copeland, and Leifer from Stanford. Uh, they are making the case studies by asking people to solve the problem. Maybe they have this puzzle problem and ask people to come to the groups and solve it. They use qualitative uh, research by looking at them and come up with a grounded theory and say, okay, first of all, you have ambiguity. You don't know what you don't know, how to solve this problem. But once the time goes on, more information coming up, you get to know what variable you have to work with, what kinds of relationship of the variable, so ambiguity get down. But at first, when you don't know what you don't know, you didn't even have a chance to be uncertain. That's why uncertainty didn't kick in yet, until the point in time that you know, for example, kinds of what is the variable, what is the relationship, then you want to find the perfect numbers to represent that variable, then uncertainty goes, goes down. And that's why, and in this case, there's uh, literature in the problem solving. In fact, Dr. Weber has already asked me a long time ago to take a look, and I'll take a look. This ambiguity size is called use structure problem. The problem is you don't even know what it is, and this is what we call in the region well-structured problems. And to elaborate more, you may want to see that why, why they can say for sure that Schroederick and Smith is not right. In fact, because in fact this is from Schroederick and Smith, they say, well, we can, you can choose uncertainty low, uncertainty high, ambiguity low, ambiguity high, but the, and there are three things you have to consider in any kinds of problems, the variable, the relationship between each variable and their actual value. In the case of uncertainty high and ambiguity high, you don't know anything. You don't know variable, you don't know their relationship, of course you don't know the value. Then, when you reduce ambiguity, now you know variable, but you still don't know their value. You don't know their relationship. Then you reduce it much more. You know value, uh, you know variable, you know functional relationship, you know value. There's a case in this case that Trader and Smith say. There's a case, this case three, variable known, value known, but functional relationship unknown. This case might be a little tricky because how come you know the value and the variable, but you don't know their relationship? It's like you have the equation, mathematical equation, x equal five, y equal 10. You know x, you know y, you know y. You don't know functional relationship. Is that really the relationship that it has to be transferred? It may be y equal x squared plus c squared or something. So this is unnatural cases or the case that Cochrane said, maybe it might not be possible to pinpoint and take, take it down. And then you can see that you have to work from case five, four, two, to one. Ambiguity reduction to uncertainty reduction. And this is a case that I explained earlier. You have level of ambiguity high. is a stage of finding the variable itself because it's all unknown across the board. And then MV lower, now defining relationship because you know the variable already, but you don't know the function of it. You don't know the value. Now, uncertainty can kick in. What is the functional relationship? What is the value? Then, ambiguity lower, uncertainty lower. You identify that value. You know variable, 
you know their function relationship, you still don't know the value. And lastly, when you finally solve the problem, find a satisfying solution, you know variable, you know functional relationship, and you know the value of it that's perfectly fit to your relation uh, to your to the relationship to the outcome that you want. And this is case five, three, two, four, one. And no, case three in this case. This is natural. And that's why the dynamic breakdown can be said that this is ill structured and information thinking well structures problem. And I guess that's all. This is all in the uh, extra chapter in my dissertation. The extra chapter has to do with that. Well, you can well. Yes. Dr. Dyer. Congratulations, Sunny. Thank you. Good job. Now, I have a few questions yes. on uh, your conclusions and the degree of generalization. I'm going to build upon what Dr. Uh, Anderson has ever said. In terms of uh, uh, looking at the ICAP, right, and having almost 90% uh, sample response rate. Now, uh, taking that, what you learned there in ICAP, okay, and applying it to other things, for example, you say the other examples of innovation intermediate years are industry, university, government. So imagine you're at an interview tomorrow at Boston Consulting. Okay. okay. Uh, the day after at the University of Washington. And the day after at specific workplace national labs. So how would you advise them on this topic based on what you found? I would advise that um, because the nature of the model itself is generalizable, so I try to prove the relationship of what social capital has the impact of the outcome. So in this sense, even though we use ITAP as the unit of study, it can be replicated and you can use this model in uh, Boston Consulting if they do what we do by doing, finding the problem solution seeker, have the expert and match them together. If they are doing that, of course, ease of reach is good. Do not invest in trust or mutual understanding and try to be more in the organizational heterogeneity. So all the conclusion may be or may not be the same, but the general ideas of capturing the relationship is similar in the sense. On, and you can run the model by using this instrument go and ask their own uh, intermediary agent, fill out the questionnaires, run it again with my SPSS or R's program, see if the hypothesis has been proven or not proven, and which particular variable is has positive or negative relationship. But my suspicion is that the relationship should be the same or quite the same. Difference in the degrees of particular organization. This works well with anything. Boston Consulting, University of Washington, Pacific Northwest. So you're, you're saying that uh, the relationship would like to be the same? Yes, but I cannot say for sure until you go on and collect the data and run the model. So what you're suggesting is you're hypothesizing that the relations are the same you should go and collect data in this organization. And yes, that can, and that can be done and they replicate the study. What will be the alternative to that? I mean, what if you contact, let's say, uh, 500 national labs in the US, mm -hmm. right? And do this survey and you have one person from each national lab responding. What would be the difference in terms of the degree of general, like, generalization? It wouldn't be any Different, the difference is that now there are the uh, representation. So now from one organization, you take a look further down or you go look back and then you say, okay, this is for the countries, maybe. Which is 
totally workable in this case. But then they, you, you will conclude with statistical significant confidence level that this is what the degree that this particular country is. So which study would you go to next? The one that you have sampled from all national labs and I don't know, have 10, 15 percent sample rate? Or you just go to, uh, say, one of these and redo, the, redo what you did? I, I would say that the, the more sensible or more doable thing is to go to have the management by me from the one particular organization. And that's, that's good in the sense that you can help each organization develop their own strategies that match their needs. Of course, the bigger pictures of the whole countries or the whole region would be helpful. But that, if you ask me what to do next, I suggest uh, combat or organization itself. Thank you. Well, again, congratulations. Very well done. So I have just one question, and it's not a general question. Um, you use social capital uh, in, in the study and um, drawing on a wide earlier and thank you very much Dr. Taylor for pointing that out because um, in fact the theory of social capital I have to thank Dr. Taylor for pointing out the bridging and bonding and in fact I refer her paper which is very good in explaining the bonding and bridging aspect and in this particular case I have shown with the data here that uh, bonding and bridging has to be together and then I, I can say with a certain degree of confidence that uh, this support the view of Bocock that say you have to have synergistic of social capital, not one or the other. While uh, Coleman and Burns always say, you, in fact, even Coleman and Burns in the literature, they have their camp say, I want to do network cultures. I want to do um, bridging structural holes, but they didn't deny that there's another size of the coin. The problem is that because social capital is such a huge and highly used and it's so easy to grab, people just tend to pick one or the other because, for example, you do the research, you can measure just, just as much. You cannot measure everything. So in the case of work, they draw the social capital network and try to find the uh, link between people and come up with the structural holes theory, why Coleman has the relationship in the network closures. But again, I guess they are talking to the same thing, different side of the coin. So I still say this dissertation confirm synergistic view of social capital need for bridging say that it contradicts anything that is in the other I, it contradicts, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's contradicting anything. Could, would you uh, have any uh, contra contradicting view to share? No, I don't, um, no. but I, I was curious what, what you felt um, that it did.
not as innovative as I would like them to be. And you were telling me I'm supposed to manage the individual social capital of the people working for me. What do I do to get them to be more innovative? Well, we can see from our result, we need people to be more innovative. One thing, you have the organizational heterogeneity. You don't want to associate yourself much with people that you in the same group. So maybe you can advise them to go into the uh, conference to meet new people, to meet new people <coughs> in different groups of the R&D team, to meet new people from the team. Uh, that's one thing. You can also ask them to, of course, um, get more ease of reach, uh, build more risk to people. Don't be over trust people. Yeah, so much work with them. Specifically, what do I do? Do I hire a different oh, people or do of, I organize? Of course, them? this is one way of doing. You can advise people to cultivate the culture for themselves. Another view, of course, as a manager, you have a chance to hire people or get new people into the group. Then, if you think it that way, you see the result, you say, okay, people are so the same. I can hire some people that may stir the, the sameness in the group to help them to be different. Maybe hire, uh, maybe we see that our R&D team is all people from department, PSU, maybe you hire somebody from um, Japan, just to be different from them. And that's already in the idea you increase social capital of each and every everyone individual in your team. Because now you bring in the link from outside. They have a chance to interaction. And these also confirm other theory in the literature in organizational and management want some different cultures, you want different chair in the team. It's all work very well. So I still suppose this can be a guideline helpful to the managers. Another question, what would you do differently the next time? What in that study was something where you say, in hindsight, I should have approached this maybe a little bit differently? I would uh, redesign the questionnaires to be much more not time consuming and capturing the element, but again, because when I go and sit down and talk with the um, ITA or my unit of study, they, they would say, okay, this is interesting, you ask all of this. But when I end the interview, they will always complain or say, well, I have a problem with this in, when I'm working. Uh, you cannot, it's like we have a conversation, interview conversation. So maybe, and I see Dr. Weber here, because he's an advocate of using qualitative and quantitative together, maybe we can capture that complaint into the you know, um, qualitative way, have a structured question or unstructured interview with these numbers and all this supportive information we can come up with a much more rich uh, analysis and sound conclusion. I, I have another question based on the question you So doing what would you do differently? Now, uh, I mean, you basically studied ITEM, right? And we're making all these conclusions based on what's happening there. What makes ITEM unique that say, okay, whatever they do is what we should do. Uh, ITAP is typical, as, as, as explained earlier, it's not that it's unique or not unique, but it's the prototypical or the example of innovation intermediaries that we use, or that the literature has been defined. They have one side, social seekers with this SMP the other side expert, uh, university expert in the university, laboratory in Thailand, and or even abroad, and they have this ITAP as the middleman to manage them together. So the 
study is not that it's unique in the sense, but it's generalized because it's the example of the typical innovation intermediaries. So any other innovation intermediary with this kind of relationship can use this study as well. What I'm saying is what have they done successfully? Then basically helps us. Okay, oh, let's go. The let's pro go for example, the project in ITAP, which is help, as I mentioned, maybe people want some kinds of concrete example. We have these uh, factories in Thailand who are trying to find a way to, as you know, Thailand want to be a food capital of the world. We have this nice suite. Thai sweet, but it's not well packaged. You cannot send it out to the US in the first place. I mean, it's get, get bad after two days in, on the shelf. They want to know how we can have the better packaging than contact ITAP. ITAP, go and ask the expert in the food, in the packaging area in the university, and come up with a new machine to see use the air and then still keep the flavors of this sweet, nice, sweet, that can be prolonged on the shelf life. And that's kind of example that the company who want to gain the benefit of the technologies has a question of how to preserve this food and export. And the expert who are working as the food expert or the packaging expert in the university, but they will never be together if without ITAP fighting them and match them together. And then Thailand being an emerging economy, so we can take that and apply it to other emerging economies like the Middle East, like you know, several is coming out there yes. in Asia. So that's kind of a, another contribution that we should look into now. But then maybe doing it in a developed country, yes. like Germany, right? You may want to look at okay, what are the differences and what are the differences. So kind of then start building these on country level uh, funds. Yes. Or not country, but town, where they are in their economy. Yes. Yeah. Say, are you aware of any examples of something like ITEP with the exact same function in developed countries? Or yes. do you only undeveloped, underdeveloped uh, countries? In developed countries? developed countries, that exactly, I wouldn't say exactly like ITEP, but I would say ITEP. Copy this model 40 years ago. This is from IRAP. IREP, which is the uh, from Canada. The Canada has a research council, and they have this IREP organization. And people from National Science and Development Agency of Thailand yeah. go and take a look at this model and say, "Wow, that's good." Because in Canada, they have this IREP, which has these uh, people, uh, expert in university or company in the region. This is called year. Uh, Scovatia, whatever. If you have problem, come to us. We can help meeting you with this expert. Then we copy this to Thailand. So, and then I realized with my example, the uh, MEAP, the MEP, the Manufacturing Enhancement Program of the National Institute of Science and Standards in US. This one is uh, the news lately is what they call reshore. By because they say these kinds of program try to help the small manufacturing in the in the US. In fact, in Oregon, we has the successful story of I don't know the company that packaged the fruit, maybe have have has have and Davis using this by going to this MEP program and asking them to find the expert on preserving the fruit so that they can have this fruit basket and deliver it to different states. This is their success story on the website of MEP program. But my question wasn't whether or not there is one in developed world country. The question is they can whether or not this is what's happening there versus not there or different, yeah. right? So whether or not they do the same thing with respect to MEP. Yes, we have. I mean, Semantec is exactly what we're yes. talking about. They, uh, the companies like Intel and AMDs send an HP, send a representative to Semantec, that's whatever they And then they then 
or to manufacturers of these manufacturing equipment or the social providers, and then they come here and then these and go back and implement it at their company. So those systems exist. My question is maybe we will find differences. Maybe these guys do actually have this or maybe they don't. But we okay, don't know. I see. Yeah, yeah, we don't know for sure. Yeah. Then you can uh, further study the card uh, uh, model and try to see. Well, along those lines, do you think if we give you another organization where, let's say, we take what we produced to try to try to get ourselves a new master student or something and do this somewhere else, do you think that's doable? I think that's doable. Yeah, okay. Let's okay. take okay. your room for the first program. Okay. I think that's another question. I have a couple of questions and then a second question. One, yeah, first of all, you're doing a good job. No question about it. You shouldn't compare to it. If somebody asks you, this is very good, wonderful, so what? What would be your answer? Uh, my answer is that, well, uh, at least I tap as the organization that I'm going back to work. They can benefit from this. They can take a look and see this result will help us in the way that we want to get more efficiency, more innovation. The manager should help the ITA to build upon the model, maybe give them more uh, ease of reach, not doing more, not trust more than it should be, cultivate people according to the model. So that's one thing that uh, can be answered so what question. And also the uh, theoretical model itself that link uh, social capital, innovation intermediaries, and problem framing. People can build upon this and try to see more if there is uh, actually this dynamics link. It's not proven, it's just a case study. You can build upon this and try to see if what I've said what we expect is true or not true. So, both practically and theoretically. Okay, I'm glad you said that ITAM uh, is going to do this. Uh, one, uh, as Dr. Uh, uh, Sally Taylor said, uh, this is a confirmatory story, I have said it. Uh, you're saying that uh, ease of reach is important. Uh, Trust is important, but it should not be here in trust. So, but I'm thinking one, uh, and you did this at ITEM, that it leads to two things. One, be careful about the use of the term generalization, generalization, generalization. You did have, this is, you demonstrated your ideas in ITEM. So this is what ITEM is telling. Uh, yes, you did have virtually not 100%, you did uh, corrections for uh, missing and so forth. But you're talking about 50 people in one organization. But uh, you mentioned NIST, for example. NIST, uh, those things are not new, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, that program existed. In fact, National Academy of Sciences did a study to evaluate them. And I was in that uh, evaluation period in the 1980s. Yeah. Uh, uh, and there are hundreds of people doing this. NASA has, or had, something like 12 or 13 centers and universities doing exactly this, and it's in different universities. If you really think about that, every editor of a research journal is an intermediary. And uh, if you ask a journal editor what the important things are, they would say that it should be ease of reach when I go to the uh, referees. And, uh, I'd like to know what they're doing, but I don't want to really build it up on all those people. In fact, I've known a lot of uh, editors being removed because they were just using a small group, and mostly they were going to their students to do that, and that was impeding. So uh, that's, there's nothing uh, extraordinary in that. But if you're going to generalize, uh, you, I don't know that you can say that the, this is generalizable to those thousands of people in the world. It's an application demonstration there. Uh, so be careful about that. 
That was my suggestion. And my uh, question is, uh, the last few weeks apparently you spent a lot of time to run your, mod, uh, your data twice. But what is your take? Were, were you trying to see if this other package R is accurate? Or, uh, I mean, if it is, uh, uh, and if, I mean, if that's important, how about, say, BMD, for example, uh, biomedical? Uh, they have something covered with experiences. And let me, let's just sit down and come up with 250 statistical packages. Do you want to run it for 250 of them? Or what's no, the advantage? Uh, the, the two package running is for. Why two? Why not 15? To prove that, to check that my data input is not wrong first in the first place. Uh, SPSS is uh, commonly used, so people use an easy, uh, maybe when I'm showing the screen capture, it's easy to capture. Uh, R, on the other hand, is can be used, and I'm doing it for the benefit in the future because SPSS is paid. R is open sources. Okay. When I okay, so was your objective to say that R is also a good package? Yes. Well, then why not do it? I mean, it's free. Well, there are you know hundreds of others. Why not do it for all of them? Because oh, they're all uh, good. I have. Oh. Um, because it's I, I, I don't see the relationship between your research and running it again to show that another package is also giving you the same answers. Uh, uh, because you're using the same data. A statistical analysis is a statistical analysis. I mean, yes. there's nothing magical about mm -hmm. it. Uh, how about doing it by hand? Yeah, you know, we I mean, can do it by hand. So <laughs> what, what does it add to your research? I didn't understand it. <laughs> As mentioned earlier, I run it because I check whether the data is incorrect, but I guess I get the point of view that you ask that I run it again for everything. For the first time, yes, but after that, you can stick with one statistical package only. I didn't tell you that I run it. Yeah, so I, I didn't quite understand the contribution of running it to or 2,000 different packages. Yeah, it, the it, same it, data. It, it's the same data, correct. So I didn't understand what it, Continues to your research. Well, I, mean, I, mean, I, I asked a question that kind of led to that answer. So, I mean, if you don't mind, if I can jump in, it was more of a uh, a minor observation that he made that he happened to use two packages just across validate. He did actually not mention that he found differences in their um, stepwise regression results because they implement different algorithms between R and SPSS. That's well known. There's different ways that you can select variables. And so he originally started using SPSS because that's what I was using and teaching for a long time. R, he realized, is a powerful tool. But before he had the confidence in the results, he also wanted to make sure that these two things fit upright, that he was using R correctly. And so um, the committee was impressed that he worked that extra hard to cross-validate all his results, but that's certainly not an observation that you can turn the crank using two different programs, but it's a nice cross-validation that no errors popped up, and the observation that the, that the stepwise regression results in different variable selections caused him to go back and look at that more carefully, and that's discussed in, in the, these... No, my, what prompted me to ask that question was, it's entirely different from what Karen even did. Karen changed the, the, the approach that he was, she was taking. Well, it was a different regression model. Right. Well, but you're using the same model? No, he, he did that. that I mean, he actually, uh, that's a different issue. He ended up running with a very different uh, dependent variable than what he'd originally run, and he reran his entire SPSS analyses I mean, a, uh, a second time, and then also reran, I mean, just because he's a glutton for punishment, decided to rerun all of it in R. Well, that was a, a problem we identified. Okay. With that so the use so of a second package has nothing to do with, with what you did in the last Correct. Okay. That first one I agree with. That's good. But then if you had uh, all five members of the committee teaching something, statistics in their works, and they're using five different packages, would you be doing this for five different packages? No, no I'll just pick the one that can be used. So, I mean, I, I, I really did not understand. I understood the explanation, that if you had a different model, you tested it, I mean, that's understandable, but 
uh, running it on multiple packages, I, I don't quite Well, in this particular case, it was a lucky coincidence that, that you are a glutton for punishment <laughs> because when you did your stepwise regression, you entered everything in R as well. Nobody advised you to do this, and you got different results. And that highlighted that the algorithm in SPSS that people use as a black box is different than what maybe is the best yeah. algorithm for doing the stepwise. I mean, I sort of think so, it goes so you beyond. You got something out of it. It, see, I think it goes beyond the scope of the dissertation, but it's important. No, these packages do not all agree. And a lot of the stuff is completely arbitrary. So I don't think it, it goes beyond the scope of this dissertation, but well, this is a different study. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. What <laughs> you can, I mean, if a study is to compare different packages, that's yeah. why I said, were you trying to compare the packages? Was that your objective? That doesn't seem to be your objective. If it is, then. I would suggest to use maybe a hundred different packages yes. or something. So, okay. But uh, the explanation that Dr. Anderson and Dr. Dane gave, I understand. I mean, you had to change it and so forth. And I didn't understand the what it added to you by just punishing yourself. In fact, it's good because R is uh, open sources. I wrote a script. The script now can be used. So, and I can just save the script and use it in Thailand. I think it's more personal than... Yeah, it's yes. more yes. personal. Yes. 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 This does not show up as a contribution in your dissertation, but it's not even a side note. All right, I, that's better. And, and, and in your dissertation, really be careful about the use of uh, generalization. Okay, yes. It's uh, very well presented. And if you remember my dissertations last week, this you're born, uh, about to increase the inoffensiveness to be inoffensive. Actually, the things that you found here can be a contributor to my future research. Okay. Now my question is just, what's next for you after you go back to ITAP? How you are planning to explain your, I mean, explain your study, what, what would you? Um, well, it's because I've got the scholarship from the government. Um, well, the condition is that I have to go, work, go back and work at an STD. No signs that you leave your agency. And one requirement is that you have to present your work to the management there. And they are all who come and listen to what have you. Well, you have spent our money six years in the US. What have you learned and how can it be contributed? This I can say proudly of that I have what not not one but two contributions to the I learned how to do a good research, how to frame the research scheme step by step with a very good advice from the committee, how to eliminate all these mistakes uh, by human mistake, by uh, tools mistake, by cross-checking it. So of all this experience, I can explain to the organization, yes, the, Research or the how to do the research part is really nearly done, hopefully. And the result of the research itself can be used for the managers in ITAP to consider themselves. You want to be innovative, do this. You want to be efficient, do this. And do so you plan to continue your work building on what you've done here, or you're going to do something different? Uh, this this, for myself, I want to continue researching on the stuff, but the thing is, the position might not be the position that allow me to, but we will try as I learned in ETM, what course, you have entrepreneur, you have intrapreneur, you have to be self-aware and then pitch yourself to your management. So Thank you, because you have a really wonderful research idea that I think that there will be a lot of upcoming future research that should should be continued built upon what you did so I think it should okay. continue. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Hi, uh, Sanit. Uh, um, congratulations for a nice presentation. Um, I got, I, I mean, I noted that you, on your limitations, you pointed out that uh, maybe one is one of the maybe for future recommendation for recommendation for future study they could do somebody could do the I mean the dynamic look at the dynamic thing. And obviously I, I was just thinking that 
when you do your problem analysis, you know, you just chose, you adopted maybe from somebody's work or from the literature, and you ended up with uh, ambiguity and uncertainty. And obviously in problem analysis, I mean, that's maybe there are so many characteristics for problem solving besides those and the time. So wouldn't the ones that you did not look you look into because you adopted this model could explain whatever that might not be explainable in your conclusion. Okay. The question, if I'm getting it correctly, is that in the model there's a, the one that we pick the variable of social capital or other stuff is from the literature. Would there be any other variable that could explain the phenomenon? Am I no, I'm, I'm saying that in, in, in framing the problem analysis, mm -hmm. you left out the, dynam the, the dynamic okay. aspect, the yeah. temporal aspect of the problem analysis. So you are left with all others, but then you settled on ambiguity <laughs> and uncertainty and left out maybe in a case where you have a, a, you know, multiple, say, multiple sol solution for a problem, you know, okay. some okay. of those kind of characteristics that could be explained in. Yes, that there is. Are uh, any other variable that can be explained? But because we have our scope, and our scope of the model is this. Okay, just show this one. So this is what the scope. That's why we have the building block of the relationship. Of course, there are some other things, experiences, other available resources of the people. That may feed to, into the model, but it's not the scope of the study. You cannot measure everything in the world. So, um, of course, it's an uh, avenue for future research. If you want to take a look at experiences, at other parts, you can try to map it into the model and see if the relationship contributed to the result or not. Yes? Great presentation. Kind of following on to that question and then piggybacking on Dr. Yedder's question. One variable that I think would be very interesting is motivation. And I'm just curious to see, as you've gone through the research so far, has motivation made any, is motivation even talked about in this whole bridging and bonding? I mean, what is the motivation for me to go even talk to someone? many high-tech companies who do are not motivated seem to fall back, not a bit here. Okay, so in this sense, I sense that there are two kinds of motivation. So motivation for self-advancement, um, so you want to be a better person, or the motivation to work in general. So you have to separate, I mean, it's like in the model, you have trust for example, trust itself has different layers. You have confident, confidence, show trust or trust that people working well enough or and benevolence trust that trust that they will kind of benevolence to you or give you more. So if you want to say okay, put motivation in, again you may have to separate motivation that really take into account. Um, but from the social capital literature side, I don't see any motivation relating to the you know, social capital, the relationship that people want to have. But maybe you can uh, try to match these two fields of psychological motivation together with the um, social capital. That's, that's possible. Yeah, actually, I, I, I have a suggestion. Um, I think you learned something else in response to the next question. I think you learned how to build social capital. I mean, considering the <laughs> event here, um, you, you have your partying skills, distinctly partying, partying skills, <laughs> and you're going to have to train these guys back at ITEP, because I bet you they're a lot nerdier. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, you know, in order for their organization to, to work well, you may have to teach them how to party. Um, <laughs> <laughs> party, the first is, but yes, doctor. And I 
to cook me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, How to cook? Yeah. This, this, this is fall into the suggestion on into part. Managers can influence the organization, of course. People can be cultivated. So, but you can cultivate as much because you can motivate people. You can tell people what to do. You can recommend people what to do, or you can force them what to do. But that depends on your position or relation with them. But yes, of course, I can. Uh, well, the social capital is lateral, right? You don't have to order them to party from top down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I can ask, or I can recommend, yes, you can go and ask. It's just a suggestion, but I think yes. it would be really helpful. OK, <laughs> thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> yes. So I'm going to sort of piggyback on that. Yes, that's uh, in not, fact. Not that it was in this yeah. situation. Yes, in fact, that's a very interesting question, and it, it's the idea that we want to put the cultural into social. In fact, it cannot be totally, totally separate, mm -hmm. but in this case, we don't take a look specifically on the cultural. But I can say for um, confidence that there is the part of the cultural effect. Of course, if you are doing or going about in China, you have the Huangzi system. In Japan, you have to be in the KS. Yes. So um, yes, it's, 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 it's. And I understand the managers who work or operate in that culture has to aware the cultures in the first place. Otherwise, they cannot be able to be a good leader or the manager in that particular region. So, with the knowledge of what is better, building up on that basic knowledge of culture itself, I guess they can benefit from the social capital. Yeah, and yeah. I, yeah, well, just to piggyback on that, and I would say that if I were, um, I would probably be anticipating that uh, the skills for bridging, creating bridging social capital may be different Decided to send me here. Of course, I learned uh, American cultures, U.S. culture, and multinational cultures. So you are be, you are aware of your own cultures and make benefits of the international cultures as well. So yes, that is a, that should be a very good suggestion. Thank you very much. Research. Good question. We all your dissertation, so you don't have to worry about answering the right or wrong. There's no right answer. The, when you look at this group, right? And look at the culture that they're journey to here, like versus uh, maybe in Thailand versus in other countries. Uh, would you try to kind of see if you could get this type of culture there? For example, uh, when one thing, I'll give you an example. In Korea, uh, they, with this nation of satellite, they started giving what, scholarships to uh, students from like old Soviet states, mm -hmm. bringing them up to uh, Korea in different basic uh, engineering uh, departments for PhD and masters. They also, similar things started happening in Germany uh, way back. Uh, so what do you think about that? Yes, in fact, um, but the case of Thailand, you can, uh, we have 
like Asian Institute of Technology, yeah. which is situated next to an STDA in near Bangkok. They have been an effort to try to bring in different uh, people, different students, but the problem may be because of the uh, technology advance in Thailand is not might not be such a strong field to get the people, but maybe in other field, I might say hotel management, hospitality management might be the case if you want to go in that realm. But and again, technology and engineering management can apply. Right? So, uh, I'll just make it simple. First of all, really congratulations. But uh, I'll just uh, build up to what uh, Dr. Weber said and Dr. Dane Tar Stefan. Uh, you are not going to be the director in uh, NASA, obviously, uh, but you are going to have, I mean, you're not going to be the authority, power for that, but you're going to have the de facto authority. <laughs> de facto authority, coming from your, what you have learned, what you've done, and uh, in terms of globalization, you're not going to, I mean, there are a lot of uh, places doing that, uh, you're not going to have the globalization experience in the last like, six years or so, to 45 different countries, students coming from there to the ETM department, uh, I don't think you'll find that anywhere else. I mean, certainly not in any of the PSU departments, but in any of the universities either. So that is going to give you an additional moral authority in your knowledge. So I hope that you can teach them to party and to cook. <laughs> 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 